behalf of the foundation, you know, welcome to our fifth Civil War program held in conjunction with the Lincoln exhibit here at the library. And we are so fortunate to have been selected to host this wonderful national exhibit, but it will only be here now until February 8th. So if you have not yet had an opportunity to visit it, I urge you to do so. Our last program in the Civil War series will be this Thursday evening at 7 p.m. with Carl Guarneri, a Civil War scholar and St. Mary's College professor who will lead a discussion on the movie Lincoln. Registration is full for that, uh, but uh, if you have not registered and would like to attend, be sure to go into uh, the Foundation website and sign up on the waiting list. The Walnut Creek Library Foundation raises funds to support both Walnut Creek libraries, provide programs such as this one, and add to the collections of each library. And this Civil War series has been made possible by the generous support of the Thomas J. Long Foundation, Wells Fargo, Sharon and Barclay Simpson, our print sponsor, Miniman Press, our media sponsor, the Contra Costa Times, and friends of the library like you who support the foundation. So thank you to all of our sponsors. The title of the exhibit is Lincoln, the Constitution and the Civil War. And this evening we have perhaps the core program uh, for the exhibit. Constitutional law scholar Vikram Amar will talk about the constitutional issues Lincoln confronted and what lessons we might draw from his approach to them. Vikram Amar is Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Professor of Law at the UC Davis Law School. You know, my son Joel entered the UC Davis Law School in the fall of 1995. And on his first day, in his first class, he walked into Professor Amar's Civil Procedures course. And after introducing himself, Professor Amar said, is Joel Donahoe with us this morning? <laughs> and proceeded to grill him on the assigned pre-reading, a Supreme Court case. And Joel claims he was grilled even on a footnote to the case. <laughs> and he says he did OK, and it certainly made him well known among his classmates. And I don't mean to suggest anything, but you know, I'd just like to point out that Vikram Omar is a graduate of Las Lomas High School. My son Joel is a graduate of Northgate. <laughs> Professor Amar is a graduate of UC Berkeley. Joel was a graduate of UCLA. <laughs> Professor Amar received his JD from Yale Law School where he was articles editor of the uh, Yale Law Journal. After graduation, he clerked for Judge William A. Norris of the U.S. Court of, of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and then for Supreme Court Justice Harry A. Blackman. In addition to UC Davis, Amar has taught, taught for a decade at UC Hastings, and as a visiting professor at UC Berkeley School of Law and at the UCLA School of Law. Professor Amar writes, teaches and consults in the public law fields, especially constitutional law, civil procedures, and remedies. He has published widely, including articles in the law journals of Yale, Stanford, Cornell, Virginia, California, Georgetown, William and & Mary, and many others. He authors a bi-weekly column on constitutional matters for Justia.com, one of the most visited websites devoted to legal issues, and is a frequent commentator on local and national radio and TV. It's my pleasure to introduce Vikram Amar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom, for that, that wonderful and, and personal introduction. And uh, probably the first thing I'm going to do when I get home is 
uh, dig back through the directories now, which are all online, and, uh, and, and, and look uh, Joel up. I hope he's doing well, and tell him to come visit us sometime. Uh, thank you all for inviting me and for coming tonight. It's a special honor and pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, my parents still live in Walnut Creek. Um, some of my best friends uh, still live here. In fact, uh, um, one of them is a, a friend going all the way back to preschool, Daniel Schoenholz, who's sitting there in the back. Um, he actually, uh, he, he constructs crossword puzzles for, among other places, the New York Times. Um, and uh, his crossword puzzle on the Lincoln theme is part of the exhibit outside. So when you go look at the exhibit, you should look at that puzzle. Um, and then one of Dan's and my uh, former teachers uh, at Las Lomas, Gordon Lindsay, is here. And it's wonderful to see uh, old friends and, and mentors. Um, I still have my papers from AP English. And <laughs> when, I, when I'm feeling disappointed about writing skills of 20-somethings today, and I ask myself, am I demanding too much? I go back and look at them and realize that, no, even an 18-year-old can write a grammatical sentence once in a while. Um, <laughs> So, but it's, it's, it's nice to have you all here. Um, during this uh, sesquicentennial commemoration of the Civil War, uh, I thought I would talk about three of the many themes that, that ran through Abraham Lincoln's presidency. Uh, states' rights, uh, the relationship uh, with the Supreme Court uh, and the president, uh, and this question of partisanship. How do you deal with kind of hyper-partisanship? And in doing so, I want to draw some parallels and also some distinctions uh, between how Lincoln handled these things uh, and the present era, uh, in which another president who served as a member of Congress from the state of Illinois, uh, and indeed someone whose very political career would not have been possible uh, without the accomplishments of Abraham Lincoln, um, grapples with these same issues uh, in the White House. And let's start uh, by going back to 1860 and setting the stage uh, against uh, the backdrop against w which uh, Lincoln uh, in, uh, became president and was inaugurated. You know, it's, it's kind of easy, at least for those of us who are uh, older, uh, to remember four years ago how dramatic the events were in that period uh, leading into and ensuing from uh, President Obama's election. I mean, again, you, you just think back, there was that, that uh, momentous collapse of Lehman Brothers. I think it was probably September 15th. Uh, and then there was that meeting between H Hank Paulson, then Secretary of Treasury, and Ben Bernanke. Uh, and then they called leaders of Congress into an evening meeting on Thursday of that week and, and told them that we are days away from a worldwide financial collapse uh, and that something major has to be done. And that's what generated the TARP and, and uh, early uh, forms of the stimulus, et cetera. Um, but you know, as, as kind of dramatic and as tense as that moment was, that was nothing compared to what Lincoln confronted when he uh, took over. Um, after Lincoln was elected in November 1860, and before he took office um, the, the next uh, year, several state governments purported to declare their independence from the Union and to establish the Confederate States of America. James Buchanan, who was the lame duck president, declared their actions invalid, illegal, impermissible, but did nothing to stop them. Indeed, he publicly questioned his own power to do anything, to act unilaterally, and also questioned Congress's power to make war on a state um, because they're not a foreign country. Uh, so it wasn't clear how the Union um, uh, could be preserved by force, uh, at least under the views uh, of, of President Buchanan. And so everyone kind of waited for Lincoln's take on this momentous states' rights issue, the relationship between the state governments and the federal government, and how he was going to conceive of it. And he gave his answer in March 1861, when he assumed the office. And his, his bottom line was strong and clear. The actions of the states were not just wrong-headed, but a violation of the Constitution. And he was duty-bound to resist this unconstitutional action to maintain the Union by essentially all means necessary. Um, here's what he said, quote, no state upon its own mere motion can lawfully get out of the Union 
and resolves, that is resolutions or ordinances to that effect, are legally void. I therefore consider that in view of the Constitution and the laws, the Union remains unbroken, and to the extent of my ability, I shall take care as the Constitution expressly enjoins upon me, directs me, the Constitution in one place directs the President to take care that the laws of the United States, including the Constitution, be faithfully executed. So he's invoking the so-called take care clause. I should take care that the laws of the Union be faithfully executed in all the states. Doing this, I deem to be uh, only a simple duty on my part. And another example of kind of Lincoln's maybe false, but, uh, but modesty. It's like, oh, this is no big deal. I, this is just my job. Um, and I shall perform it as, so far as is practicable unless my rightful masters, the American people, shall withhold the requisite means or in some authoritative manner direct me to do something contrary. The Union will be constitutionally defended and maintained. So his path was clear, but his kind of theory for how and why he could do that was a little bit murky. Um, the South had argued that the Constitution was a compact, an agreement, a contract between the 13 and then more sovereign states that of course did not have to join the Constitution in 1787 when it was, when it was proposed. And it's true. The Constitution said that the ratification by nine of the 13 states would trigger implementation of the new agreement. Because remember, in 1776, we had a different um, document that governed it. That was the Articles of Confederation. That's what governed the United States between 1776 and 1787. And no state that did not want to ratify the new constitution had to do so. There was no requirement that the state be a part. So the states in the Civil War took the position that just as we didn't have to join, we are free to leave. It's a compact. We don't no longer agree to be part of your group. And at times, Lincoln rejected the compact metaphor, but at other times, he accepted it, but then argued that under compact and contract theory, a single party to an agreement cannot unilaterally dissolve the agreement. A single party can break the agreement or breach the agreement and violate the agreement, but to rescind the agreement requires the consent of all the parties. So even if the, United, the Constitution is a compact between the states, not all the states have agreed to this. Not every single one has, has allowed this to happen. But the problem with that is that what if a majority of Americans, an overwhelming majority of Americans, by a congressional statute or by a constitutional amendment um, or by some national tally, some national referendum. What if a, a super majority of Americans decided they wanted to let the southern states go, but one state held out because one state didn't want to allow it? If it truly was a compact, then that state could block even the super majority of the rest of us. So Lincoln quickly or, or slowly moved away from the compact theory altogether, and he said the problem with secession at base was not that it's violating some agreement, but that it is anti-majoritarian. It does not reflect the will of a majority. He acknowledged that a majority can always basically change the legal rules pursuant to some orderly process, um, whether it, that orderly process is a congressional statute or an amendment of the Constitution under Article 5, that the essence of American democracy is majoritarian rule. Um, and that the problem with, uh, with secession is it's, it's anti-majoritarian. It's a minority of folks that are trying to impose their will on the majority. Um, here's what he said. Plainly, the central idea of, of secession is the essence of anarchy. A majority held in restraint by constitutional checks and limitations is the only true sovereign or legitimate power uh, of a free people. Whoever rejects majority rule does of necessity fly to anarchy or to despotism. Unanimity is impossible. So he acknowledged that we can't require that everybody agree in order to make a move in a new direction, but the rule of the minority is wholly impermissible, inadmissible, so that once you reject the, quote, majority principle, the idea that majorities rule, anarchy or despotism in some form is all that is left. 
Now, interestingly, the southern states, I think, would have agreed with that, that you know, uh, minority rule is problematic, but that begs the question, who we're talking about when we're talking about a denominator for purposes of the majority, uh, for purposes of the majority and minority. Um, let me make one other point. Lincoln actually always took the position that even in the South, there was a majority of loyal Unionist citizens, and that secession was contrived by a minority of Southern leaders. Whether he was right or not, this was always his public proclamation. Um, here's what he said to Congress in uh, July of 1861. Quote, it may be well questioned, it may be questioned whether there is today a majority of legally qualified voters of any state, except perhaps South Carolina, in favor of disunion or secession. There is much reason to believe that the union men are in the majority, if not in every single other state, um, uh, at least almost all of them. The contrary has not been demonstrated in any other of these states. So Lincoln said this was minoritarian because it was a coup, it was an undemocratic coup, even in the South. But he would back that out, he would, he would, he would have a fallback argument that says even if a majority of Southerners decided that they wanted to, to secede, secession still would have been anti-majoritarian because the relevant denominator is the people of the United States, not the people of any one state. Again, it goes back to this idea of what did the states give up when they joined the Union? How much of their inherent power to be a separate, distinct, sovereign entity did they cede when they joined the Constitution? Even though they never had to join the Constitution, once they did, they moved power from the people of each state to the people of the United States. When the first words of the Constitution say, we the people, form this union. That's a reference, Lincoln says, to we the people of the United States, not we the people of each of the separate individual independent states. Okay? Let me give you kind of a corporate analogy to help uh, drive home the theory that ultimately I think is probably the, the best theory to explain why the Civil War was, was, uh, was illegal um, uh, and, and why I think Lincoln's view is right. If you have two companies, Corporation A and Corporation B, if someone says, hey, these two companies should merge and form Corporation AB, in order to effect that merger, you need a majority of shareholders of company A to agree and a majority of shareholders of company B to agree. Okay? You can't force either one to join the other. But once they do that, and you have the new company, AB, and you issue sh shares in, of AB to all the former uh, shareholders of A and B, the people who used to own stock in A can't later say, hey, we want to undo this and get out. It takes a majority of the shareholders of AB to dissolve AB, not just the uh, buyer's remorse of the majority of shareholders of A or B. So that's, you know, he, ultimately the Constitution is kind of thought of um, uh, more as a corporate arrangement between all of these uh, groups of people rather than a contract between the, the, the independent states. Well, let's fast forward to uh, today. What do these states' rights battles have to say about um, modern America? Well, in some ways we're still grappling with these issues at a very fundamental level. Now happily, you know, secession and its close cousin nullification are uh, kind of not talked about so much, although you read in the news um, that a lot of uh, uh, petitions for secession have, st have, have generated some steam in various states. And um, President Obama, uh, in order to kind of vindicate the petition clause of the First Amendment, it's an underknown clause of the First Amendment. First Amendment, we think of freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, uh, the, uh, the ban on establishment of religion, et cetera. But there's another clause that says you have a right to petition government. And it's never been given a lot of independent life by the Supreme Court, because most of what we think of as petition activity falls within the protection for freedom of speech. But at the founding, petitioning was not just about being able to say what you wanted. It was being about being able to require the government to answer you. So you, know, so you, 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 you give them your grievances and they, they have to respond. So President Obama uh, on the White House website has set up a system whereby if enough people sign on to a particular petition, 
then the White House says it's obligated to respond. So um, it, it has had to respond to requests to secede on behalf of Texas in recent months. Um, but secession is largely a fringe matter. Um, but there are other important fundamental uh, questions of, of, of uh, states' rights that aren't. Uh, perhaps the easiest example to talk about is the, the big case last year from Arizona, where Arizona passed SB 1070, um, which was an attempt by the state to essentially regulate uh, immigration uh, policy in a way that went beyond and was different from federally enacted policies on the ground that the federal government wasn't doing what the people of Arizona wanted to do uh, to protect and, uh, uh, and enforce the laws in Arizona. And um, again, happily, we're, we don't come to, to blows over this. Uh, instead, the Justice Department, pursuant to President Obama's directive, filed suit against the state of Arizona. Uh, in the case uh, Arizona versus United States, in the district court, in the trial court, it was US v. Arizona. And the United States prevailed at the Ninth Circuit level, uh, getting a court to basically block much of Arizona's law. Arizona then sought review in the US Supreme Court, which generated the decision uh, Arizona v. US, in which the Supreme Court gave uh, the Obama administration uh, kind of a mixed uh, victory, not a, not, a, not a knockout blow, uh, but, but uh, uh, largely ruled for the federal government. Um, but Justice Scalia dissented and in doing so said a lot of things that harken back to the pre-Civil War era. He resurrected this idea of state sovereignty, which today is more of a rhetorical notion than a legal concept in a lot of respects, at least, at least as regards to the supremacy of federal law when there's a clash between federal um, uh, law that's validly passed and state laws uh, uh, that might uh, represent the views of a locality but uh, not the, the, the country. And he says, quote, as a sovereign, Arizona has the inherent power to exclude persons from its territory even if the United States wants otherwise. Uh, quote, in securing its territory in this fashion, if, if securing its territory in this fashion, uh, what Arizona did, is not within the power of Arizona, we should cease referring to it as a sovereign state. So he has a theory by which states do retain a lot of incidents or attributes or elements of sovereignty. Uh, and just because the federal government passes laws that disagree doesn't mean the state is powerless uh, to safeguard its own boundaries. Now, he was a dissenter, and he didn't get um, a lot of uh, uh, other justices to agree with this. But these, um, these disputes, this, this battle of ideas um, over the, the, the essence of state-federal relationships continue uh, to brew. Before we leave kind of secession, um, let me mention one other uh, uh, aspect of Lincoln's election. You know, one could reasonably ask why the southern states seceded rather than simply waited four years to get this bum from Illinois out of office. Remember, Lincoln won with about 40% of the popular vote. He won because the Democratic Party had two candidates. They didn't coalesce around a single candidate. So it was basically a three-person three race uh, in which he won. But it's not like he won across the country. He wasn't even on the ballot in states south of Virginia. Okay? Um, uh, so uh, he won um, you know, the Electoral College by a majority. Uh, and he won 40% of the popular vote, which was more than anybody else, but he lost 60% of the popular vote. And if it had been just a ballot that said Lincoln and anybody but Lincoln, um, he would have lost 60-40. Um, indeed, the Electoral College had a tremendous skew in favor of Southern states uh, before the Civil War, before slavery was ended. Why is that? Because remember, the formula for how many electors each state gets in the Electoral College is the number of House re of, of Representatives members it has plus two for the, no the two senators it has. So every state has a, a number of electors equal to the sum of its uh, House members and its senators. That's fine. But remember, before the abolition of slavery, states got to count their slaves as three-fifths of a person for purposes of how many House members they had in Congress. Okay. So states like Virginia had 20% more electors in the Electoral College than states like Pennsylvania that had more free voters. Pennsylvania had more voters and Virginia had 20% more electors. So in, uh, in you know, the election of 1800, for example, when Thomas Jefferson beats John Adams, it's only because Virginia is overweighted. Indeed, for 32 of the first 36 years, 
after the Constitution, the president is a slave-holding Virginian. Okay? Jefferson, Washington, Madison, all these guys. So, you know, as long as slavery and the Three-Fifths Compromise were around, the, the South was going to do fine. The question is, why did they, you know, pick a fight that, you know, a lot of people thought they weren't going to win, rather than just kind of ride it out? And I think one answer is, um, and my brother has written about this, I have an older brother who's also a constitutional law professor, and one answer is, one of the things that Lincoln would have done if the South had remained in the Union, or had, had, had not tried to get out, was to open up the lines of communication and information in the South. The Southern states had basically prohibited anybody from criticizing slavery. Blatant violation of the First Amendment idea. But remember, before the Civil War and before the 14th Amendment, the First Amendment does not apply to state government. It limits only the federal government. It's not until after the Civil War that any of the Bill of Rights provisions, as a matter of law, um, constrain not just the feds, but the states as well. So states are free to do what they want as far as the federal constitution is concerned until after the 14th Amendment. So one of the things Lincoln was going to do was use the post office and the power of patronage to pick local postmasters. And if you've seen the Lincoln movie, you'll see the power of patronage, especially as regards the postal office. That was a huge part of the movie. Um, I'm not giving anything away. It's a factual account. Um, uh, but that would have really put a lot of pressure on the institution of slavery because then people would have been able to distribute and receive and send pamphlets criticizing slavery. The information flow would have been much greater than it had been, and that's what a lot of people were scared of. Now, again, fast forward to today, um, a lot of the important battles um, today over uh, the two parties uh, involve in some significant measure, disputes over access to information. Uh, today, the, the, the concern is actually the converse. Not that there's too little information, but that certain entities get to distribute too much information and drown everybody else out. That's the debate over Citizens United, the case that says corporations and labor unions can uh, spend money for, um, uh, uh, to support um, uh, candidates and, 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 and causes. Um, uh, as long as they're not giving it to the candidate, but rather expending it independently um, uh, of the candidates. Um, but the basic concern is, is still, well, how much information, what kinds of access to information serve democracy best? Um, and that is the same uh, today as it was in, uh, in 1860. Um, and you know, we don't think about um, you know, corporate finan uh, campaign finance as the, the dominant civil rights issue of our day, but it is by far the single biggest policy and constitutional issue on the map. It drives everything else. It, it, whatever your views on it are, it, is, it ramifies and makes, it, it, it explains and accounts for um, whatever deals we're able to cut or not cut in Congress. Um, the way the, the rules of the election are structured, especially as regards money, um, that's where the action is. Okay, um, well let's move to the second uh, theme, the uh, role of the Supreme Court and its relationship to the President. You know, in the modern era, most other actors in Washington DC and even Sacramento, they tend to think that interpreting the Constitution and the laws is a matter for the courts and that they should not really uh, stick their nose in these things. Um, so for example, when President George Bush signed into law the McCain-Feingold campaign finance reform law that was largely invalidated in Citizens United by a five to four vote, President Bush in his signing statement said, I think parts of this law are unconstitutional, but that's for the court to decide. Okay? Um, you see it this week. Uh, uh, the House of Representatives passed uh, a law to, or a bill, it hasn't been come a law yet, passed a bill to suspend the debt ceiling, okay? it, it, to buy a few months till May on the debt ceiling. But they coupled it with uh, this provision they called the No Budget, No Pay Act. 
which says if either House of Congress does not adopt a budget, its members don't get paid for months and months and months. Okay? Um, the 27th Amendment of the Constitution explicitly prohibits any law, quote, varying, i.e. changing, altering, the, the, the compensation paid to members of Congress from taking effect until at least one election cycle has taken place. Okay? I mean, this is as textually clear a prohibition on something as you can imagine. And yet the House passes this, maybe thinking that's for the courts to decide. You know, we don't think about those things. It's up, it's up to uh, uh, these lawyers. Now, Lincoln didn't have that view. Lincoln was a sharp lawyer. And he thought that the court's interpretations of laws and the Constitution were important, but that they are not exclusive of other actors' ability to interpret the Constitution. They don't crowd out the constitutional vision, the constitutional interpretation of presidents and members of Congress, et cetera. So here's what he said. He said, quote, I do not deny that the decisions of the court must be binding in a case upon the parties in the suit. And they are also entitled to very high respect and consideration in other departments of government. The rest of us should listen and look and learn. But we're not necessarily bound by what the Supreme Court has said in the way the parties are. So that in different cases, we are free to pursue a different understanding of the Constitution, even if it's one we know that the Supreme Court would not agree with. He goes on to say, um, the candid citizen must confess that if the policy of the government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irrevocably fixed by the decisions of the Supreme Court the instant they are made in ordinary litigation between parties and personal actions, if everything is locked in, if, if the court by its ruling prevents anybody else from really uh, acting on any other different understanding of the Constitution, the people will have ceased to be their own rulers having to that extent practically resigned their government into the hands of that eminent tribunal. So what does that mean? That means that um, uh, Lincoln was very critical of the Supreme Court decisions like Dred Scott, the decision that said um, an individual has a right to take his slave anywhere in the United States and the, and the federal government can't do anything about that. Um, it means that when Roger Taney, the Chief Justice who uh, decided both Dred Scott and also ruled on some early Civil War cases, when he uh, issued a ruling acting as a single judge trying to block some of Lincoln's war measures as an impermissible suspension of the writ of habeas corpus because um, Lincoln kind of made it hard for people who were being detained by federal authorities to to challenge their detention uh, without and, and, and individuals claimed that that was a violation of, of, the, of the, the provision in the Constitution protecting the so-called great writ of habeas corpus. Roger Taney agreed with, uh, with the, the challengers and Lincoln said in effect, paraphrasing from something Andrew Jackson had said about former Chief Justice John Marshall, he said that's Taney's decision, let him enforce it. Okay? Now today again we don't have uh, a president taking that quite extreme um, independent vision, but pretty close. Like, like Lincoln, Obama is um, uh, a, a well-trained constitutional uh, lawyer, and he's critical of Supreme Court decisions. Remember the flack over the uh, State of the Union address when he um, called out the Supreme Court? I didn't think in overly um, uh, harsh terms on the Citizens United case, um, and, and a lot of the justices were miffed, to which I say, well, then don't go to the thing. I mean, there's nothing that says you have to go. <laughs> you, know, you and your opinions criticize the president all the time. Read Scalia's dissent in Arizona versus the United States. Um, you're free to criticize him publicly, but he can't criticize you publicly. Um, but probably more uh, um, uh, meaty, uh, meat, uh, meaty is the decision that uh, President Obama has taken in uh, the same-sex marriage debates uh, to not defend an act of Congress, the Defense of Marriage Act, the so-called DOMA. This is a federal law passed when President Clinton was in office, 1996, that says for federal purposes, marriage is reserved to unions between a, single, a union between a single man and a single woman. Um, and that is under challenge. And the president has said, I agree with the challengers. I think this is unconstitutional and therefore I am not going to defend it in court. Now most of the time the president defends the work of Congress 
as long as a reasonable defense can be made, even if he thinks the law is unconstitutional. The general history of the office of the Solicitor General, which is the, the part of the Justice Department that represents the United States in the Supreme Court, has always been, um, we will defend any law for which a reasonable defense can be made. And whatever you think about the Defense of Marriage Act, there are reasonable legal arguments in support of it. Whether they're winning arguments or not is a much more complicated thing that depends on, on how you read things. But no one would deny, I think, that, that the, uh, the defense of DOMA is not a, a frivolous one. And yet the president, because he does not agree with that defense, and he's never said it's a frivolous one, he simply says, I'm entitled to my own vision of the Constitution, and therefore I'm not going to defend a law that I don't like, or I don't, I, I, that I don't, I don't think is constitutional. Now, interestingly, that creates problems for the Supreme Court because to defend DOMA, the House of Representatives hired an outside lawyer, former Solicitor General, very nice guy, very bright guy, a guy named Paul Clement. And he, on behalf of the House of Representatives, has defended the DOMA in the federal courts in which DOMA was being challenged. And the case is now pending in front of the US Supreme Court. They're going to hear arguments on it in March. But the Supreme Court has asked the parties to give briefing on the question of whether um, an outside entity can represent Congress when the president has decided not to defend a law. Or instead, is the president's decision not to defend the law essentially um, uh, 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 killing the law because then uh, n uh, no, uh, no defense of it can be made? Uh, so this is all based again on the president's current understanding of his relational role uh, with the Supreme Court. Okay, the, the gay um, uh, rights um, uh, episode, I think illustrates another similarity between Obama and, and Lincoln, and that has to do with kind of the incrementalism by which they came to rally around what they viewed as uh, the seminal civil rights issue of their time. In Lincoln's era, of course, it was, it was, it was racial equality. Uh, and, that, and Lincoln is known as the president who freed the slaves and, uh, yeah. and, and for racial equality. But, but he got there very incrementally. Remember, the, the Republican Party's first stance was simply the federal government can regulate and prohibit the extension of slavery into the Western territories. They didn't say anything about abolishing it where it exists. Okay? Combined with that, remember Lincoln, as late as, as 1861, 1862, was still talking about, um, about blacks leaving the United States to go live in Africa or Central America or something. I mean, his vision was um, the federal government should free the slaves, perhaps, in the South, pay the slave owners for their loss of property, a taking, just like you can take physical property, you can take this property. Uh, but compensation is required, which of course never happened after the 13th Amendment. No one got compensation for loss of their slaves. And then the slaves would leave. It's like uh, Mitt Romney's self-deportation idea. You know, um, uh, they, they'll, they'll go uh, live elsewhere. Um, he then moved to the Emancipation Proclamation. But remember, the Emancipation Proclamation was not grounded on any high-minded principle. It was, it was defended as a, as a military exigency to help stir up um, dissent in the South and help the Union troops. And indeed, it did not free the slaves in any except those areas that remained under active rebellion. It didn't free the slaves in, uh, in states that had not um, left the Union or parts of states uh, that were, were calm even if they were, uh, they were committed to slavery. Uh, then, of course, uh, he championed the 13th Amendment, and the movie Lincoln is all about the process by which he got the 13th Amendment through Congress. Um, and then finally, just days before his death, he finally um, acknowledged that maybe blacks should be allowed to vote, which was a separate issue from emancipation and was required a 15th Amendment uh, a few years uh, hence. Um, but uh, he came to that very slowly, and during the whole debate over the 13th Amendment, uh, and his passage in Congress, he was kind of cagey about whether um, this means or should be extended ultimately uh, to the franchise. And um, you know, the biggest argument he advanced in, in terms of the franchise was the same one he gave for the Emancipation Proclamation, and that is war-related. Black soldiers died to preserve the Union. They, uh, they, they displayed honor and courage. How can you ask people to die for the country and not give them a, a voice in, in the affairs of the country? Um, that was the, the theme. And that, by the way, that's, that's been a theme um, uh, throughout American history when we expand the franchise. When did women finally get the vote? It's not coincidental it's after World War I, when women filled a lot of the positions that the men vacated to help 
the war effort. Right? Rosie the Riveter is not just a World War II thing, it really goes back to World War I. Um, who got the vote um, in, in the 1960s? Poor people and young people. Right? We got rid of poll taxes and we lowered the voting age in the, in the Constitution to 18. Well, why do we do that? Because young poor people were the ones dying in Southeast Asia. They were the ones dying in Vietnam. You know, we're gonna send, you're gonna send them to die, but they can't vote for a president to end the war? So there's always been this linkage between military service and then ultimate full citizenship in voting. Okay, um, finally, let me say just a few words about this partisanship idea. Um, oh, oh and, and, and just to close the loop on the uh, same-sex marriage, um, it, you, know, you, you know that Obama got to where he has been very incrementally, right? Just a few years ago, he was supportive of civil unions. Then he said, well, maybe marriage, but it should be a state-by-state -state thing, not a national mandate. Um, then he said, well, the DOMA is a bad thing, so maybe the federal government should recognize same-sex marriage, but again, shouldn't impose anything on any state. Then he says the DOMA is unconstitutional, and there's a, there's a federal constitutional, implicitly he's saying there's a federal constitutional right to enter into gay marriage um, throughout the United States. And then, most recently, in the inaugural address, he elevated the issue to the stature of one of the few uh, that he wanted to talk about in his, uh, in his inauguration. Um, so again, it's this incrementalism. And, and, and I don't, I'm not being critical of either Lincoln or, or Obama. I'm just saying people can become very important and powerful and committed to things, even though it took them a while for either practical or for philosophical reasons to fully understand um, uh, where, where things had to go. Um, that brings me to the, uh, the partisan uh, aspect of Lincoln and Obama's presidency. Um, I already quoted some from Lincoln's first address, his first inaugural address. Parts of it he, he reminded, he closed by reminding the South that we are not enemies, that we are friends, that we are brothers. But then he says it's up to you, you know, whether this is going to be resolved peacefully or by the sword. So it was, it was kind of, uh, it was an entreaty tinged with, uh, with force. And I already, talked, uh, I already told you earlier, he had said, look, I'm gonna defend the, the Union by all means. Um, you know, it was a very feisty, fiery speech. Um, his second inaugural, however, was much more uh, gracious, if you will. Um, the, the catch, I mean, second inaugural was only 700 words. I mean, most of these amazing Lincoln texts are just a few hundred words. The Gettysburg Address is, you know, 200 some words or 180 words. I mean, it's very short. Um, the speeches today are much longer and longer uh, and uh, longer winded. Um, the, the, the signature closing line of, of uh, Lincoln's second inaugural was, quote, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in. Let's, let's get the last phase of this war over with. Let's finish this war, get it over with. To bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may, uh, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace amongst ourselves and with all nations. Um, now, a lot of people uh, have kind of either criticized or at least commented on um, how uh, non-gracious or how partisan um, Obama's second inaugural seems to have been. That he didn't really uh, reach out to the other side and talk about compromise and commonality, but rather laid out a more robust uh, vision uh, for uh, a left of center agenda. And Kristen went to the uh, inauguration. I don't know if that's the sense people had hearing it when they were there live, but certainly commentators from all across the spectrum, even kind of uh, more liberal commentators, seem to acknowledge that was a, the tenor of the speech. So you could say, well, wait a minute. You know, Obama became l more partisan, comparing the first to the second inauguration. Lincoln became less partisan. Are they, are they well, I guess I would remind us a few things, and then I'll open it up for questions. Um, one is Lincoln had just won the war, essentially. I mean, there was, it was still winding down, but uh, unconditional surrender was imminent, and everyone knew that. So you can afford to be a little bit generous when you've just beaten your enemy and they've conceded. Um, when the war was still going on, again, go back to the, the movie Lincoln, I mean, he was ruthless. In, um, in getting his agenda accomplished. He was ruthless in the way he managed the 13th Amendment procedurally through Congress. 
Um, he wasn't Mr. Nice Guy. He, he said different things to different people. He played on people's fears as well as their, um, their aspirations. Um, but, you know, he essentially won these battles. He can afford to be a little bit more um, magnanimous. There's no surrender in D.C. today. It's not, like, not as if, uh, you know, the Republicans said, well, you won the, pro you won the, the White House, you won this election, um, so that means that uh, you get to call the shots a little bit. Far from it. Um, so that's one uh, kind of explanation for a different tone is it's just it's against a different uh, backdrop. Um, the other thing I'd say is, you know, partisanship is, is something that is, you know, not just a matter of rhetoric, but a matter of deeds and actions. And as I said, when, when push came to shove in his deeds, Lincoln was kind of very forceful in pushing a particular agenda, perhaps much more so than Obama is. I mean, that's like a lot of people who voted for Obama criticize him for not having enough of an instinct to go for the jugular. And let me just close with one example. Um, you know, as of January 1st, tax rates were going to rise on everybody. Okay? And Obama had always insisted that he wanted them to rise um, on everybody ex uh, 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 except people making less than 200,000. So the people rise only on, the, on the, the people making that amount. Now, he cut a deal at the end in which he allowed taxes to remain at the same rates for people who make up to 400, not 200,000. And the, um, the, uh, the, f the floor for the estate tax was increased to 10 million compared to the much, much lower amount it would have uh, lapsed to January 1, 2013. Now, he didn't have to do that. If he had just let the new rates come into effect in January 13, 2013, and then proposed to Congress, let's spare people who make 200,000 or less new, the, the higher tax rates, and let's um, uh, you know, increase the, um, the estate tax exemption from uh, 1.5 million to, to 5 million, uh, or to, excuse me, to, to 2 million per person, so it would be 4 million for a couple rather than 10 million for a couple. Um, they have to accept that. He, he had them beat by virtue of the fact that the Bush tax cuts were going to expire, right? Defaults, the, the baseline matters. The, the, the taxes were going back to where they were, so he had to just simply do nothing. And yet he gave them something that he didn't have to. Now, a lot of people are critical of that, who really think he should have stuck to his guns. But I don't know that if you look at the deeds as opposed to the rhetoric, um, that there's really as much force behind some of the criticism of, of Obama as being unduly partisan, um, even if the, the tone and tenor of, of some of his remarks um, uh, uh, rubs some people the wrong way, uh, as I understand. So with that, let me um, uh, open it up. We've got 15 minutes or so for questions. And I, th I guess Tom's collecting the questions yeah, and is going to give them to me. If, uh, if we do all these questions, I think we'll be here for most of the night because um, uh, they, they do um, uh, suggest some, some commentary. But let's start with a historical one, going back to the issue of secession. It says, please comment on the four states, Rhode Island, that reserved in their ratification statements the right to secede. Well. Um, you know, just because you say something doesn't make it so. Um, you know, Lincoln, Lincoln is, is famous for having asked, um, you know, what, how many legs does a dog have if you call a tail a leg? And the answer, everyone says, well, five. And he says, no, four. Calling a tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. Um, so I think, I think that captures it. Well, that was shorter than <laughs> <laughs> that was a very Lincoln-esque ask. Uh, there, I had a couple of questions on uh, the conflict between the federal government and the states, particularly California, on um, the marijuana laws okay. and other drug sure. laws. So uh, it's a great question. That's a, that's an area, by the way, in which the federal government. Well, first, let me lay out what the rules are. The people of a state. California, Washington, Colorado, can certainly make marijuana permissible under state law if they want to. No state is under an obligation to make any particular activity criminal. The federal government cannot tell a state, you have to make this a crime of the state of California 
um, to do X. Okay. States are free to define their, Cal state of California could abolish all of its criminal laws tomorrow. You say, well, we just don't like criminal laws. We want people to have liberty, okay? At the same time, the federal government has the lawful authority to enact and enforce whatever laws the Constitution gives Congress the power to adopt. And in a case from 2003 called Gonzalez versus Raich, the Supreme Court held that Congress does have the power to make it a federal crime to possess, use, distribute, produce, sell any marijuana, even medicinal marijuana. The federal government can prohibit that if it wants to, and it has done that in the so-called Controlled Substances Act. So the federal government is free to make it a federal crime, but then it's the federal government's job to enforce that. The federal government can't tell California police, hey, you got to do our work for us and arrest people. That's why we have separate federal enforcement agencies like the FBI and uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearm, et cetera. So there's really not any kind of big question about uh, how, what, the, what, the, what the roles here are. The states can decide not to make something a crime so they don't throw people in state prison and we're not wasting the time of state police and state prosecutors, et cetera. But they can't interfere with the federal government's doing its job. Now, the federal government actually has tried to cater to the wishes of people of various states by saying, even though the Controlled Substances Act prohibits all possession of marijuana, and even though we could enforce that law as, as vigorously as we want to throughout the whole United States, we as a policy matter, as an enforcement matter of the Department of Justice, Attorney General Eric Holder said, again, probably because Obama said this was a good idea to do, um, that we will not make it a high enforcement priority to go after medicinal marijuana use in those states in which it is legal under state law. An acknowledgement that, you know, we want to uh, defer to the people of the state, but as a matter of constitutional law, if the federal authorities wanted to arrest and imprison every single marijuana user in the state of California or the state of Colorado or the state of Washington, there's no constitutional problem or question about that. Uh, with Prop 8 and DOMA being considered together by the Supreme Court, what are the possible outcomes? And also, has the issue of standing, Ray, Prop 8, been settled yet, or is that part of the discussion? So Prop 8, of course, is the California law um, uh, prohibiting same-sex marriage here in California. It's built into the California Constitution. And the DOMA is the federal law that defines marriage uh, as only between a man and a woman for federal purposes. Uh, and also says that no state shall be required to accept any same-sex marriage from another state that it doesn't want to. So if same-sex marriage is, is lawful in New York and you get married there and you move to, uh, to Alabama, Alabama does not have to credit your marriage. That's what the F Defense of Marriage Act says. And they're both, both laws have been challenged both laws were struck down by lower courts. Um, Prop 8 was struck down by the Ninth Circuit, and uh, DOMA was struck down by the Second Circuit, and they're both pending in the US Supreme Court. In both cases, there is a significant question of whether the Supreme Court can, or should, or will ultimately reach these difficult merits issues of, of exactly um, uh, what same-sex uh, rights are under the Constitution. Uh, in the, I mentioned in the DOMA case already, uh, there's an issue of whether um, the House of Representatives can defend this law by hiring outside counsel when the President of the United States has decided not to defend it. Okay. In the Prop 8 case, the Attorney General and the Governor of California, Jerry Brown and Kamala Harris, have also decided not to defend Prop 8 against this federal constitutional challenge. It's challenged, uh, both of these laws are challenged as violating the 14th Amendment's protection of, of uh, a principle of equal protection of the laws and, and due process of the laws. Um, in, in, the, in the Prop 8 case, um, what the Ninth Circuit held was that the sponsors of Prop 8, the, the persons who gathered the signatures to put Prop 8 on the ballot, that they can step in the shoes of the state and the voters of California to defend Prop 8 against constitutional challenge. Um, and I'm not sure the US Supreme Court's gonna buy that. The US Supreme Court may say, um, we don't have a valid case here because the only proper defendants, the Attorney General and the Governor, 
have decided not to defend the law, which means the plaintiffs get to win, right? If, if, you, if you challenge a law and the, and the authorities aren't defending it, um, uh, you get to win because otherwise the, the authorities could always frustrate your rights by simply saying, I'm not going to defend. So the, the same-sex couples get, the four same-sex couples in the case get their marriage licenses, but no court ever really would rule then on, um, on the merits of the challenge. Um, I say this because, I should, I should make my position very clear, I've written a lot about this. Um, if you're going to have an initiative, it makes sense to have a process by which someone other than the Attorney General and the uh, governor can defend the measure if the governor and the AG decline to defend. Why do I say that? Because the very idea of the initiative is that sometimes our elected officials don't do right by us and we need a process to circumvent them. Okay? So if you have an initiative, you already have some distrust of elected officials. So why would you give the elected AG and the elected governor kind of an absolute right to kill anything that you enact over their objection? But having said that, that doesn't mean that the sponsors of the law who no one knows and who no one chose to represent them should be the right ones. If Prop 8 had said somewhere in it, if the AG and the governor do not defend this law and it's challenged and the following people shall be defending it, and the voters enacted that, fine. But in the absence of that kind of authorization, I think it's very dangerous to give to unelected people whose views on Prop 8 may be very different than even the mil those of the millions of Californians who enacted it, uh, the power to represent the voter. I mean, the reason the Attorney General and the Governor get to represent the Californians is because they got millions of votes. Um, the sponsors of Prop 8 didn't get any votes. What they proposed got votes, but that doesn't mean that they and their views of what it means and how it should be defended um, uh, are popular among the voters. So going forward, I think initiatives should be written carefully to acknowledge the possibility that the elected officials won't defend and to make a provision for that. Um, but the Supreme Court can easily dodge these thorny... Ma the Supreme Court has no desire to take these issues up right now, right? <laughs> it's, o it's only because the Second Circuit and the Ninth Circuit forced these cases on them by invalidating the laws in question. If, if the Second Circuit and the Ninth Circuit had ruled the other way, if they had upheld the DOMA and Prop 8, Never in a million years would the Supreme Court were grant the rev review uh, at the request of same-sex couples. They, they would want more time to, uh, to pass and more, the issue to percolate. They have no reason to jump in. So they may appreciate a plausibly principled legal way of resolving these particular disputes without having to say too much and standing may be um, a, a way to do that in both cases, especially the Prop 8 case. Um, in your initial words, you emphasize uh, the majority principle and that Lincoln used it in his arguments opposing secession. Is there a constitutional justification for Lincoln's argument and is not the principle broken repeatedly? For example, electoral college. And I assume by that many states give all of their electoral votes to the, to the winning candidate as opposed to splitting them. Yeah, so I mean the electoral college is an anti-majoritarian institution. So is the Senate. Um, and they can't really be defended by reference to the intellectual foundation that gave rise to the revolution and the rest of the Constitution. The Senate and the Electoral College are part of an unholy deal that was cut because the southern states wouldn't have joined absent them. Right? And it's not the small states, big states sitting in the Senate. It's slavery as well. Um, uh, the Electoral College for complicated reasons, doesn't really help small states even though they have two votes for their two senators. I mean, think about it. Where is the action in the campaign? It's not in small states. It's in mid to large states that are undecided, right? Um, small state people don't become president. In the history of the United States, I think only two presidents have come from a small state, including Bill Clinton. I'm counting Arkansas as small, which is it's not even that small. But none of these presidents come from small states. Um, but, uh, but at the founding, it was clear that the division was about slave and free, and the Southerners would never have joined the, the Constitution if there had not been this provision for the Electoral College where they get to count their slaves as extra for purposes of, of how many electors they get, because they knew then they're going to be overwhelmed by the more numerous um, uh, free base voting in, uh, in, uh, in, in the northern states. Um, so, you know, you could say that, that, that majority rule is, is violated by the Constitution, and it is, um, but that, that would not 
be a principle that would control except for the fact that it's written into the Constitution. Um, you know, every other election for governor, for house member, for, for uh, any local official, it's all majority rule. That's, in the 1960s, we got rid of gerrymandering whereby urban voters had less voice than rural voters and we adopted the one person, one vote principle into, and, and said that's part of the Constitution. Um, the Electoral College and the Senate are there just because they're hard to get rid of um, and the Electoral College is not so hard to get rid of and I'll just uh, make a plug for something that I've been involved with for over a decade now. It's called the National Popular Vote Plan Movement. Um, each state gets to decide how to allocate its electors in the Electoral College. And as Tom mentioned, most every state has said, we're going to give all of our electors to one candidate rather than divide them among the two candidates. And that makes sense um, because then candidates take you more seriously because there's more of an upside for them to come and make promises to you. Um, <laughs> but there's nothing that says a state can't allocate its electors to the person who wins the most votes nationwide in the election as opposed to the person who wins the most votes in that state. Now, a state is unlikely to want to allocate its electors that way unless other states are doing the same thing. So there has emerged this plan called the National Popular Vote Plan that asks state legislatures to sign on to uh, an approach whereby if enough other states have agreed to this compact such that a majority of electors come from states that are in the compact, then each of these states will allocate its electors to the person who wins the national popular vote, not the person who may won the, won the vote in that state. Now, it could be as few as 11 states if they were the 11 biggest states, because the 11 biggest states collectively account for more than half the electors. Um, so far, nine states, including California, have joined this, um, and they're halfway there to the number of electors they need uh, for the plan to get uh, uh, off the ground. There are a lot of legal complexities and I think the drafters of the plan um, who kind of uh, you know, used some writings that my brother and I and a few other law professors uh, uh, wrote in the early 2000s, um, they, they didn't do a few things I really wish they had done. Um, so as it's currently constituted, it's not free from glitches, but um, it's an idea that, that um, you know, I didn't think would ever have any traction. It was one of these things you write and, you know, you write a lot of stuff. Um, uh, that's what you get paid to do. Uh, but, um, but the Electoral College is actually something that you can effectively change without amending the Constitution. The Senate's a harder thing because uh, the Constitution says no state shall be uh, deprived of equal representation in the Senate without its consent, which would seem to give every state an absolute minority veto over any attempt to change. Um, and even if, you, even if that weren't true, um, you know, there's no similarly, uh, I think, elegant way to, to uh, avoid amending the Constitution if we wanted to change the Senate. And to amend the Constitution, you need three quarters of the states to sign on. And of course, uh, the small states are not going to consent because Wyoming likes having as many uh, votes in the Senate as California, whether that makes any sense or not. <laughs> I think this may be the okay. last question sure. because it, uh, it, it may spark some, some uh, <laughs> controversy. What is your interpretation of the Second Amendment and, <laughs> and how it governs today's controversy on gun control? Well, I'm not, an, I'm not an expert on the Second Amendment. I should, I should uh, uh, preface, that, uh, preface my remarks by saying that. Um, but I do buy the arguments, for the most part, that um, even though in 1789, 1791, the Bill of Rights is, is, uh, is being considered, that at that time the Second Amendment was not really about an individual right but rather only um, kind of militias and a collective right. Um, that changed by the time of the 14th Amendment after the Civil War, um, at which time there was a lot of discussion of the need of blacks to be able to own guns as a constitutional right in the South to defend themselves from the Klan. Um, so if our, if our point of focus is not the founding, but as it should be for modern purposes often, the Reconstruction Era and the 14th Amendment, because we don't, we don't talk about the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, but they account for the modern shape of our Constitution more than the original Constitution in a lot of ways. Um, 
And if one focuses at that moment in time, uh, then there, 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 there are credible arguments um, uh, accepted by five members of the Supreme Court in the Heller case that say uh, there is an individualistic component um, for self-defense. But none of that means that government is prevented from regulating the kind of weapon, the size of weapon, the amount of ammunition, um, from denying people who are not um, uh, kind of uh, good stewards of guns to have guns. Uh, you know, uh, registration, waiting periods, background checks, none of these things, I think, uh, implicates um, almost anyone's understanding of the Second Amendment. And even the five justices in the Supreme Court who, uh, in 2008, uh, for the first time in U.S. history, said there is an individual rights component to this, they may, went out of their way to say we're not at all saying that government can't regulate this stuff. What was at issue in that case, and then the only other case the U.S. Supreme Court has taken, were absolute prohibitions on handgun ownership, even for people at home, even for self-defense. So that's a far cry from um, you know, prohibiting uh, uh, clips and magazines that, 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 that carry 30 rounds or prohibiting you know, uh, uh, automatic or semi-automatic weapons. That's, there's a lot of space in between those things. Um, and there's no reason to think the Supreme Court is, yet, is going to be particularly hostile uh, to uh, uh, attempts. This is another area where the Supreme Court has understandably said that we want to wait and see how things play out, why they were in no hurry to answer all the questions. Um, we'd rather uh, kind of see how the backdrop uh, changes. So with that, thank you all uh, very much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you.